All right, I think we are going to get started. Great. Hi, uh, welcome to New America and today's lunchtime event, um, Listening In, How Encryption Can Preserve Cybersecurity in an Insecure Age. My name is Kevin Banks and I'm the director of the Open Technology Institute, uh, which is the internet policy and technology development program here at New America, where we focus on ensuring that all communities have access to an internet that is both open and secure. A big part of ensuring the security of the internet and our communications and our data is ensuring uh, the right to develop and access and use strong encryption technologies, uh, uh, a right that is under threat right now. The threats that we face and the role that encryption can play in protecting us from those threats is the subject of this book, which is the center of today's discussion, Listening in Cybersecurity in an Insecure Age. And we are very happy to welcome today the author of this book, Susan Landau, who I will just read her bio right here. Susan is Bridge Professor in the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and the School of Engineering in the Department of Computer Science at Tufts University, uh, and is visiting professor at University College London. She was previously a senior staff privacy analyst at Google and a distinguished scientist at Sun Microsystems. She is an Association for Computer Mach Computing Machinery Fellow, a Cybersecurity Hall of Fame inductee, and an American Association for Advancement of Science Fellow. Uh, she is also serving on the committee at the National Academies of Sciences that is currently weighing the encryption controversy and uh, the issue of law enforcement and intelligence access to plain text. Uh, that report is in process, so Susan won't be able to speak to that, but it is coming hopefully soon, uh, and I expect we'll have some real impact on the debate here. Um, but we are lucky to have Susan here today for a conversation. She will come up and talk for 10 to 15 minutes about some of the ideas in her book. Uh, then I will join her on stage along with our second guest for the day, uh, Alvaro Bedoya. Alvaro is the founder and director of the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law and is an adjunct professor there. He was previously chief counsel for the uh, Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law and senior counsel for the chairman of that committee, Al Franken. And so he and I will be engaging with Susan in conversation about some of the ideas in the book and in her opening comments, which will start now. And then after that conversation, we'll have some questions from the audience. And we should be wrapping up by around 1.30. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And Susan, welcome. First of all, I'm delighted to be here, and thanks very much, Kevin. Um, so I want to talk about revolutions. I, uh, can you guys hear me if I stand over here? I want to talk about revolutions, and I want to talk just very briefly. The agrarian revolution took between 100 years and 1,000 years, no matter where on the planet you were. From the time people went from hunter-gatherers to doing crops, it was 100 to 1,000 years. And think about the number of generations that was. The Industrial Revolution, when it first started, it was a two-stage revolution. First, it was the mechanization of textiles, and then it was the mechanization of mechanization. And that was about 100 years in the parts of the world where it started. Now, in many parts of the world, it's happening much more rapidly. But in that period of 100 years, we've got two generations, three generations, four generations, most likely four in terms of how quickly people had children. And now, let's think about the Digital Revolution. When I think about the digital revolution, I don't think about the computers that were part of the Second World War, and I don't think about the IBM mainframes of the 60s and 70s, or even the PCs of the 80s and 90s. I think about uh, iPhones and Facebook, because that's when it became the way we really changed the way we live. And now think about how long that took. That's 10 years. That's 10 years. Now, we think we've adapted to it. You know, we walk down the street. We check the phone for whether we turn left or right to come to New America Foundation. We walk down the street. We check our emails. We respond. We bump into people in the street because we're checking. You know, I'm a New Yorker, and I really hate it when people use their cell phones and they don't walk at the right pace. But we think we've adapted to that change. But we really haven't. And I want to tell you an example of why we haven't. Right now, factory floors are being networked. They're being networked because some of the factory floors have very expensive machines. They have million dollar machines to assemble things like cars and tractors, heavy machinery. These machines are great, much more efficient. 
What the company that built these machines, FANUC, realized is that if they networked the machines, they could start to notice when a particular type of robot, one of these million dollar robots, was having trouble. If they saw the same kind of slowdown in a couple of machines, they could then recommend to different factories in different parts of the country or different parts of the world certain kinds of proactive maintenance. Okay? Very useful. Now, how do factory, flaws authentic factory floors authenticate people on the floor, people to control the, the devices? By recognizing people. Everybody knows everybody on the factory floor. What happens when you network? That form of authentication disappears, okay? Because we're using something that is no longer valid. Because we're, we're controlling from somewhere else, but we haven't really thought about authentication. Authentication is not part of the control systems of factory floors, floors not in any real way. And that's part of the story I describe in the book, how we, we have moved very rapidly in one way, but our mental models haven't moved. So I should have brought my phone up, but I didn't want it to ring, so I left it in another room, and I didn't think that I wanted it as a prop. But I wanted it as a prop, and the prop I wanted as is we need to authenticate ourselves all the time. We all know about the DNC hack, um, and the DNC hack happened for a number of reasons. Uh, Podesta and others were spearfished, but also they weren't using second factor authentication. They weren't using a second device aside from a password to tell, to authenticate themselves to an account. What do you use that's easy for second factor authentication? You use phones. What has the FBI been arguing for the last year and a half, two years, that they should be able to open phones no matter what. What my colleagues and I, uh, in a paper in Keys Under Doormats and in other work, have talked about is when you make phones easy to open, you make it easy to open for lots of people, not just law enforcement. And the problem with making a phone easy to open is not just the data in the phone, but also the software in the phone. Computer scientists don't think, computer scientists see software and data as exactly the same thing. If you make it easy to get at the data on the phone, you've made it easy to get at the software on the phone. And you've destroyed the ability to use the phone as a second factor for authentication. That's the argument I present in somewhat more detail in the book about why the FBI's arguments about making phones easy to open are a bad idea from a security viewpoint. The other thing that law enforcement complains about is end-to-end -end encryption. The idea that when I have a conversation with Kevin over the over a electronic media, whether email or phone, um, that it'll be end-to-end -end encrypted so only Kevin and I can understand the conversation. And everybody else listening in gets white noise. And the FBI and law enforcement argues that it destroys a tool they've relied on for decades. They have relied on wiretapping for decades. But if you think about human communication, of course, human communication has always been ephemeral until quite recently. That's the first point. There's lots of reasons why it should stay ephemeral, and I suspect we'll talk about it later. But the point I want to make right now is you can't outlaw end-to-end -end encryption because it doesn't matter whether it's baked into the device. It's in apps. Is every phone that comes across the border going to be examined for every app to see whether or not it provides end-to-end -end encryption? Surely not. That battle is over. That battle is over, and it's over both because you can't do it and also because it's not good for our security. So with this, I want to just end with a very brief discussion of where our threats are. Every time law enforcement, whether it's the FBI or the DOJ, talks about threats, they talk about child pornographers, they talk about uh, terrorists, they talk about um, drug dealers, and so on. I posit that there's actually a far more serious threat that doesn't get mentioned or doesn't get mentioned as it should, and that's the, the threat to our democracy. Um, it's a little bit funny to be talking about encryption right now when we have this much bigger threat, but in fact, encryption is, is what will protect us in many ways. I'll stop here because I know you two have lots to talk about and question, so I'll, I'll let us do it that way. Thank you. So I want to start on a small personal note because I was looking at the acknowledgments in your book and there was a very cute acknowledgement of your husband, Neil, who said, sure, write a book in six months. I'll do everything else. Um, was there a sense of urgency in writing this book? Why did you feel the need to hurry up and write a book in six months and well, make your husband do everything else? Well, so I should say he didn't do the leaves and we had a lot of arguments about that, but, and I do say that in the acknowledgments. Uh, 
so I testified in the Apple FBI case in uh, March two, 2016, just at the height of the F Apple FBI case. I testified in Congress. And at that point, um, after I testified, I was largely on Apple's side. After I testified, I had a lot of invitations. I had a, a, an interviews, and I thought, this isn't scaling. I expected that not much would happen on the encryption issue during the campaign. I did not expect uh, us to have President Trump in office. And I expected round about now, we would be having a debate on the encryption issues. And I needed to get the book out for now. Mm -hmm. So that was the six months. Well, and so the encryption debate did go pretty dark, no pun intended, um, this year, because in many ways the FBI has been preoccupied with a number of different things, including a change in leadership. And uh, the Mueller investigation, I'm sure, has been a big deal. But now, in recent weeks, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein has come out and, and been renewing the FBI's calls uh, uh, against warrant-proof encryption and in favor of responsible encryption. Um, I'm curious, first off, this debate is often framed by law enforcement as an issue of privacy versus security. Uh, what do you think of that framing? Is that accurate? And what do you make of this call for responsible encryption? Uh, and how long do I have? <laughs> so, All the uh, time you want. Susan. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about why it's not privacy versus security, and then I'm sure Alvaro at some point will say, but privacy is really important, and I absolutely 100% agree. But I'm going to say right now it's not about privacy versus security. It's about security versus security. I already briefly sketched out why making your phones easy to open is actually bad for security. It removes long term the ability of your phones to act as a second factor authenticator. It also puts Apple's update process at risk and all sorts of things, long term security risks. Um, I want to step back and think a little bit about the risks we have as a result of the Russia investigation. I'm not going to talk about the stuff on social media, but I am going to talk about the stuff related to encryption. At the same time that the Office of Director of National Intelligence issued its report back in January, saying that, yes, there had indeed been Russian interference in the election. One of the points it made is that organizations viewed as likely to be sh uh, shaping foreign uh, US uh, policy, uh, civil society organizations, had also been the targets of Russian hacking. And I want to walk you through what happens when that occurs. And I want to walk you through by going back to 2008. The climate group at the University of South Anglia in, in the UK, East Anglia in the UK, uh, had been hacked, and their emails went up on the web. And commentators who didn't believe or argued against the idea that climate change was occurring began selectively quoting and making it appear as if the scientists had m messed up the data, were, were take, tweaking the data to make things appear that climate change was happening when it wasn't. In 2008, when the theft occurred, a majority of the American population believed climate change was occurring. The House of Representatives had voted to support the bill that was coming up, the, the treaty that was coming, the agreement that was coming up in Copenhagen. Within two years, support within the U.S. had dropped substantially. Support, trust of scientists working in climate change had dropped substantially. And U.S. Senate never acted on the Copenhagen agreement. Um, the point is that civil society is really threatened. Civil society groups might need to protect their memberships if, for example, um, they are a group of military personnel who have formed an LGBT group. That group would most want to protect its membership lists. If they're a group producing reports on climate change or other controversial issues, they might want to protect their reports or their email. Think about what happens to an organization like the Union of Concerned Scientists or the National Academy of Sciences or New America Foundation, if they issue a report and it turns out their data is off by 20% or 30% because somebody tampered. These organizations are not organizations that have the funds or the capability to do secure protections. They need to rely on consumer devices. They need to rely on end-to-end -end encryption. They need to rely on secure mm -hmm. on secured devices. And to some extent, we need to rely on actually deleting stuff again, like Absolutely. learning to not keep everything forever. And it seems like what Rod Rosenstein has argued and what uh, Comey argued before him, he's framing this uh, uh, debate as, well, you know, Gmail 
has the ability to give us access to the email. Facebook has the ability to give us access to the messages. That stuff is encrypted between the server and the user, but the, the company has the ability to access it. Why can't we just engineer everything like that? Why can't we just engineer everything like that? So I'll give you the example that occurred for me last week. I was exchanging mail with somebody uh, about a delicate topic. I really wanted to go down the hallway or give this person a call, but I wasn't in a position to be able to do that. So I had to do it on an electronic medium that's sort of permanent. I looked at this piece of mail. I didn't want it on work email. I looked at this piece of mail. I thought I could send it on a personal account. The person I was communicating with happened to have a personal account that was Gmail. I thought about saying, P.S., please hit delete forever once I, I put this in. I thought, this person will think I'm putting a lot of complexity and tension into the discussion. Do I really want to taint the discussion with all of that? In the end, I just said something like, I'm saying this, please be very discreet. But this was not something I wanted to put in email. This is not something I want in a Gmail server forever. If you go back to the Sony case, one of the things that happened is tremendous embarrassment because people said all sorts of gossipy things. We say things all the time. We have, for hundreds of thousands of years, said things all the time that we expect to be impermanent. Hey, you're not looking very good today. We don't want that around. Or hey, they weren't looking very good today. We don't want that around forever. Um, there's lots of reasons why communication should be ephemeral. And, well, and speaking of the Sony hack, um, or the DNC email hack, or the Podesta hack, uh, if all that email hadn't been sitting there, they couldn't have leaked it. Or if it had been sitting there in an encrypted form, right. you know, it couldn't have gotten out there. So it seems that there's definitely... There's a, there's a deep irony here yeah. that the FBI is arguing so strongly against encryption, and yet had the DNC systems been strongly encrypted and protected in other ways, there would, you know, it would have undercut a good deal of the Russia scandal. Yeah. And uh, instead that the FBI is now so centrally focused on, on, on fighting. And they seem to yeah. basically be arguing for a world where if you have any intermediated communication at all, right. it should always be accessible to a third party, ideally the provider, and preferably stored somewhere. Right. Which is not great from a security perspective, and I would guess is not great from a privacy perspective. Right depending on how you conceptualize the difference between privacy and security. So uh, lest we just uh, argue about how much we agree with each other, I, I want to uh, um, I, I play devil's advocate here and press you on a couple things. I'm glad and, somebody is. Uh, excellent. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I, one of the reasons I was really glad to do this is I'm not a, 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 a cryptography guy. I'm not an encryption guy. Um, I've been learning a, a, about it along with most everyone else. Um, but so much of the rebuttal uh, um, to this pro-encryption argument is, uh, to this anti-encryption argument is, is the Berkman don't panic argument of, okay, fine, yeah, you can't read the emails, but you can tap into the echo, and you can, you know, uh, um, listen from the smart television, and you can use all of these other attack surfaces. Um, what happens when those get locked down also? It I mean, would be great if they get locked down. Okay. <laughs> Just to pause for context, though. Berkman Center sure. for Internet and yeah. Society at Harvard issued a report called Don't Panic, which was basically about all the different things law enforcement can leverage other than encrypted communications, whether it's Internet of Things, right. metadata, et cetera, right. et cetera. Yeah. And while I largely agree with the report to which I co-signed, I didn't agree with the title. I thought it was too flippant. I think there is a serious issue here. Yeah. But it would be terrific if the Internet of Things got locked down. Okay. I don't expect it to happen anytime soon. That is, I don't expect it to happen not only within my lifetime, but probably much longer than that. Uh, the problem is that that kind of regulatory burden is complicated. Um, I, work, uh, I, do, I participate in various groups at the National Academy of Sciences. We talked about the idea of, wouldn't it be great if the Internet of Things devices that can't be updated had to die within two years, that there was a regulation that if you can't update the device, then it has a two-year shelf life. Even a two-year shelf life isn't great, but even getting that kind of regulation would be hard. But, but it wouldn't be regulation. So no one requires Apple to encrypt its stuff, right? right? No one requires any American company. Right. Well, I, I think there are some rules in certain circumstances, but in most instances when you use encryption, it's not regulation that's forcing, right. it's the market. And so what happens when Amazon locks this stuff down, Sam Samsung locks this stuff down, and companies start uh, um, protecting metadata through differential privacy and other, and other means. You know, if, is there, you know, maybe there's not a going dark problem now, but is there really not a going dark problem in that hypothetical world? I don't think so. Okay. I, I really don't think okay. so. Um, 
first of all, you need some level of metadata to, in order to make things happen. Mm -hmm. So all of you, none of you ever think about the swipes you do on your phone. You know, you just do the swipes on your phone. Those are collected. There's good reason for those to be collected. They're collected because Apple and uh, Google want to know, is the order in which they've put things on the phone the right order for you, or can they make it more convenient? That's a good reason. Suppose Apple or Google, and they are not doing this, they're really not doing this, but suppose they also collected it and said, huh, we could market a device that says you can't drive because you're really agitated right now. We can tell from your phone, and we're going to give the car manufacturer a way to lock down your steering wheel so you can't actually drive. You would say that's really invasive. But the point is, you're never going to give permission or not give permission to the collecting the swipes. There's all kinds of microdata that, that, that's getting collected. There's lots and lots of data all over the place. I mean, think about this morning I came here, there was a tax right. meter that if I had paid by credit card would have been a record. There was a metro card right. uh, that recorded where I was. There was my phone location because I hadn't shut off my phone. Right. That's all without my being. Yeah. Um, uh, Go ahead. Can't we apply the same argument to encryption, though, which is, again, play, playing double Please. advocate here. So uh, um, we're arguing you know, encryption has to be this firewall, this impregnable firewall. Don't make us put a front door, a back door, et cetera. But isn't it true that the place is chock full of windows? The place and, is. And uh, 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 I mean, the FBI was able to get into the, this device, right? Not through the update, not through these other means. Uh, um, how can we be arguing so stridently against uh, uh, um, against you know a back door or a front door when yeah when the place is full when of windows when the security is so right. terrible as it is first of all security is believe it or not security is improving uh, in 2000 Microsoft had a terrible security story uh, by now Microsoft has a security development story that other companies are emulating because software development story because their security is good within their development process. Uh, I was talking with somebody in the, on the intelligence side who said, yeah, we find bugs, we break in. The good bugs that get into lots of systems, those are rare and getting harder to find. So that's, that's yeah. one piece of the story. Yeah. Another piece of the story is we've gone to automatic updates. Now what I discovered talking at uh, Hoover Law Fair last night is that while all the security geeks I know have all their automatic updates automatically done, most of, many of people in the audience who presumably were interested in the topic uh, did not. Security updates are a really good security story. We've made them automatic. We've made them so they largely don't break things. They typically, you know, I, I, my last Apple update was not great in certain ways. It slowed things down for a few days and then it got better. But, um, but automatic security updates fixes a large piece of the problem. Yeah. I'm not saying that, that everything is good. Yeah. I know that I am much more careful than probably most of the people in the room. It means that I don't get to do certain things. That's the trade-off I'm willing to make. I'm willing to make it for two different reasons. Uh, one, I'm paranoid. Uh, but two, the bigger reason is I teach courses in security and privacy policy. And if I'm going to do that, I need to experiment on myself. Mm -hmm. And you know, so periodically, I can't do things that my friends can. Big deal. <laughs> so I wanted to respond to some of your points, Alvaro, as well. Um, I mean, first off, if it's, well, if and when everything is super secure, won't we have a going dark problem? That's a problem I'd love to have, and we're nowhere near that. Um, but also, there's this aspect of the FBI, especially earlier in the day, debate, would often uh, raise these fears of a universally encrypted future, where just everything would be encrypted, while at the same time pointing out how Google and other companies often have access to content because it's part of their business model. Those two things are inconsistent. Um, looking at the future, there will always be some services that are not encrypted against the provider so that it can serve you ads to provide you a free service or so it can have its like AI bots be your little concierge and help you with your content or a variety of other services. So in terms of the don't panic range of stuff available to investigators, there are always going to be a variety of services that aren't fully encrypted. Uh, the problem is, is that they want us as a society to make that trade-off in one direction for everyone and for every product. And that is a problem because then it means that there's no circumstance where you can have a communication like the ephemeral communications we used to have unless we are hiding in a corner somewhere. It, and, but, but let me go on further. There's another problem. And we saw that we had the crypto wars back 
uh, 20 years ago where there was regulation saying, okay, you can export devices with strong, with encryption, but you need an export license. And if you don't want to get an export license, which is a slow, lengthy process, and with this process, what you end up with is sometimes the government says yes, and sometimes it says we're thinking. And in Silicon Valley time, we're thinking really kills things. So the companies went with less strong encryption. Well, communications does what's called backwards compatible. You probably never thought about the fact that your smartphone can ring at your grandparents' house where they have the old black telephone, the old black, 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 bake light black telephone that doesn't move and weighs three pounds and has a real bell. That's backwards compatibility. Communications protocols always have backwards compatibility. So the, now that we're allowed to have strong encryption, we still have backwards compatibility with the weak encryption of 20 years ago. And you know what? People have found ways to force the strong encryption between two people who both have it on their communication ends be pushed back to go into the weak form. And so when you do something that says, let's push for weak, you end up having it for far longer than, yeah. than you maybe want. Maybe you realize, oh, there was a problem. You're locking but, yourself in. But you're people. locking yeah. society in, not yourself, but right. all of society. There's a very specific recent example of this, which was the freak attack, which right. was there were all these browsers that had built into them the ability to communicate with the weaker encryption back from when the export regulations were stricter. And Just in the case attack, they were dealing with an, a browser that uh, with a server that required yeah. it. And, but then the attack was able to force people to downgrade to that level of security, which now is easily breakable. Um, but so you mentioned the crypto wars of the 90s. Uh, there was the fight over export regulation. There was a fight over the Clipper chip, which was a thing that the NSA pushed so that uh, there wouldn't be end-to-end -end encrypted voice that they couldn't unlock. Um, what do you see as the major differences between the crypto wars of now, often called crypto wars 2.0, <laughs> uh, although we might be hitting 2.5 or 3 at this point, uh, and the original crypto wars. So in the original crypto wars, the instrument for regulating encryption um, was the export controls that I just mentioned. And the NSA wanted those controls. Um, they were on computer and communications equipment shipped outside the country. And anything with encryption for confidentiality purposes had to go through export license. And uh, for the NSA, it served two purposes. One, it gave the NSA a pre-look at things that were being sent out, and two, it prevented deployment, which was very useful because then the NSA could more easily listen in abroad. But it also had the impact of limiting encryption use domestically because companies, and I worked for one in Silicon Valley around that period, slightly towards the end of that period, companies didn't want to support two different systems and didn't want to say to European and Asian customers, oh, you know, we have strong encryption for use in the United States, but we're selling you this thing with weak encryption, it's really fine. Uh, Lotus Notes did that actually, being very public about it. And the Swedish government, uh, the Swedish military hadn't been listening and when they found out, they were furious at Lotus. But most companies chose to have just one platform and it was weak encryption. By the end of the 90s, the Defense Department was no longer so happy with this and there were a couple of different reasons. One was the Klinger Cohn Act, which required that the Defense Department buy commercial off-the-shelf computer and communications equipment. If you want commercial off-the-shelf, if you want COTS equipment, you want it to have security built in. And so they wanted to see strong encryption there. The other reason was that at that time, we were already envisioning and participating in ad hoc military co coalitions. When you have a military coalition like NATO with trusted partners, you work out communication security, you have time to do it, you trust the partners, all is good. When you're working out an ad hoc military coalition like happened in the first Iraq war, you have a situation where these are trusted partners for this war. They may not be trusted partners in three years. You don't want to expose to them techniques you know from NSA. You want something that you can use now and you don't care if they understand all the pieces of it because you're not showing them the, the jewels. And so commercial off-the-shelf equipment is really important. And then you want the commercial off-the-shelf equipment to be strong encryption. So it was for those two reasons that NSA switched. NSA also got a large pile of money to modernize because NSA at that time was having trouble that was called going deaf. Uh, whereas the FBI never really stopped fighting that war. C could you expand on that? I thought this was the most valuable thing I read in your, in your book, which was you told us this really compelling story about how FBI and NSA used to be on the same side of the encryption debate, i.e. they were, you know, for, for, for non-experts like me, against it, right? Uh, um, 
but you described how the NSA doubled and tripled down on technology and technologists, whereas the FBI did not remotely do that. And so nowadays, the NSA and the intelligence community is, is really pro-encryption and, and is saying, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't build these back doors into these devices. Uh, well, they're um, not going, some of the ex-NSA people are saying Got that. it. Well, well that's, a, that's a real thing. That's uh, right. Uh, uh, you're not hearing so many ex-FBI folks uh, say that. You're hearing, I heard some. Some? OK. okay. But, yeah. but, but, let me stick well, to your well, argument. You also don't okay. have NSA coming out with a full frontal assault on encryption. Right, like exactly. Yeah. So, right, that's more the point. Can you talk a little bit about sure. that divergence and, sure. and what happened there, why yeah. NSA took this road and so, FBI took this road? So, end of the 90s, NSA is in a situation beautifully laid out by Cy Hirsch in The New Yorker around 99 or 2000, in which uh, there's a velocity, variety, and um, another V, because of course everything has acronyms in, in, in DOD. Um, and the problem was that smaller nations that didn't used to have access to encryption were now encrypting well. There were, volume is the third one. There was increased volume of communications. Moving to the internet increased the amount of communications everybody was doing. So pulling out what you wanted was much harder. And then there was variety. Now there was email. There was all kinds of other kinds of electronic communications. There was phone. There was fax. There was, it was getting more and more complicated. And for a while, NSA was going deaf. And they had to really change how they did things. Now, if you think about encrypted communications, sometimes NSA has ways of getting in. If you looked at the Snowden papers, those of you without clearance, those of you with clearance could probably have looked at the papers before they were Snowden disclosures. Um, but if you look at the Snowden disclosures, there's a lot on the tailored access operations group and all sorts of different ways of getting into communications. Um, Can you explain what tailored access is? Tailored access is you want to get into somebody's communication stream. So you want to subvert their way of encrypting the communication. Um, it could be um, that you want to look between two Google data servers, centers, not centered in the United States. FISA doesn't apply. Then you could just listen in if it weren't encrypted. And in fact, there's a famous napkin sketch, one of the early Snowden disclosures on the Was front page of the Washington Post that upset the internet companies quite a bit um, because it indicated perhaps that the internet companies were uh, working with the government. It does not appear that that was true. And in fact, Google was already encrypting communications between the, its data centers abroad. Um, it sped up that process, and then Microsoft and Yahoo joined in. It can be taking a Cisco router being shipped abroad and changing the routing so that it stopped uh, before it goes abroad and changing something in the physical layout of the router and then shipping it. Um, it can all sorts of techniques. I mean, it could be a tailored attack, also a remote attack. That's right. Exploiting a vulnerability in a particular Absolutely. router or computer system. Or our server, any of those, any of the above. Okay. Um, so the NSA went that route. Now you have to understand also, NSA is doing a very different job than FBI and, and law enforcement generally. FBI and law enforcement arrests people and takes them to court. And they have to prove uh, a guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. NSA is assembling intelligence. It also doesn't have certain Fourth Amendment restrictions when it's operating outside the United States. So they have different jobs with different equities. All that said, um, they had wars. NSA was fighting back in the, in the 1990s, pushing a kind of escrowed encryption in which you could have strong encryption domestically, but the keys would be stored with agencies of the federal government. It didn't go over well in the United States. It went over even less well abroad. The idea that you could buy these phones that would encrypt, but the US government would hold the keys, right, it didn't sell. Um, but um, Mike McConnell, who was director of NSA during that period said recently, you know, we lost that battle and you know what? In the period since, we've had better signals intelligence than ever. Okay. I think it's worth noting that not only is the NSA less aggressive on this issue because they have their ways, you know, they, they actually have a variety of techniques that regular law enforcement don't, but also they have a defensive mission. They actually right. need to secure right. our systems uh, and want to help, you know, secure systems across the country. Yeah. And to do that, you need encryption. And so that's why you have people like former NSA head Mike McConnell, uh, former NSA head Mike Hayden, uh, former uh, DHS head Mike Chertoff, and a whole bunch of <laughs> and a whole bunch of people who aren't named Mike, um, coming out of the security and and the national security and, and homeland security space, saying 
don't screw with encryption, that's a really bad idea from a defensive perspective. Right, and in, during the course of doing the book, I even had some ex-FBI people say the same thing. Um, law enforcement, on the other hand, I've had conversations with state, so in the United States, half, uh, uh, slightly over half of wiretaps are done by state and local police. I testified in Congress in 2011, and um, on that side was uh, the uh, general counsel for the FBI, Val Capone. Next to her was the president of the uh, uh, International Chiefs of Police. He came from a small city in Virginia, and he talked about how hard it was to open phones. 2011, phones weren't locked, not the way they are now. He was talking about the variety of phones, and he was overwhelmed. So easy answer is, Federal, federal law enforcement is in an easy position to provide that kind of information. We're not talking about hard technical stuff. Talk about metadata, metadata from communications. Who talked to whom, when, which number, which IP address. Each provider does, displays it in a different way. Sometimes communications go from one provider to another. That's complicated for state and local for enforcement to understand, especially when they don't have a tech group. So I suggested during the hearing I'm not the only person who suggested it, but I said, look, feds need to set up an information sharing uh, system with state and locals. Took four years to happen. It doesn't sound like it's, it's functioning terribly well. I'm sure it's giving useful information, but it doesn't have nice interfaces the way when you go to Google or you go to Apple or you go to your iPhone to do things, everything is set up as if you're a consumer and dumb, okay? Dumb is real nice because then you just go to do what you need to do. I'm not saying law enforcement is dumb. I'm saying make it simple, make it easy. So law enforcement hasn't gone that route. Instead, over the two decades from the change, uh, from the, the first encryption wars to now, law enforcement keeps saying, make it easy for us to wiretap. You mentioned Kalia. Can I talk about Kalia? Please. The Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act is a 1994 act that said, build wiretapping capability into switches. So I want you to stop and think about what that means. It means when I'm talking to someone, there should be wiretapping capability in the middle of my communication. Okay? Now think about, can you make that secure? I went to the FCC about eight years ago, and I had a conversation there that for the first 25 minutes, I felt like I was incredibly stupid. I said, what's your threat model against those routers? Who are you protecting against? They had no idea what I was talking about. In the last five minutes, I finally redeemed myself, or rather, they redeemed my faith in myself. They said, we never thought about attacks on the routers. They put a security hole, that is, the law put a secure, at the FBI's request, put a security hole into the, the routers and switches of digital communications, and nobody was thinking about what the security protection should be. So am I talking theoretically? No, I am not. Uh, the example I mention, and, and I get pushback from law enforcement because I always mention this example, but I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, but the example I mention is that in Europe, uh, partially at, at FBI's urging, they instituted a similar set of standards. And Greek Vodafone uh, bought a switch from Ericsson, which um, did not have wiretapping capability in it. They didn't want wiretapping capability, so that was all cool. But a little while later, the switch was updated. Now, Greek Vodafone had not paid for wiretapping capability. So the wiretapping capability was put in, but auditing capability, which normally accompanies wiretapping, was not in. It was fine. The wiretapping was not paid for by Greek Vodafone. It wasn't supposed to be switched on. Somebody switched it on. We don't know if it was done physically at the telephone company or remotely, but it was switched on. For 10 months, in 2004, 2005, a hundred people in the Greek government were wiretapped. The Prime Minister, the head of the Ministry of the Interior, the head of the Ministry of Defense, the head of the opposition party. It was discovered when an SMS went awry. Um, so you say, well, one instance that doesn't prove anything. Second instance, I talked to somebody at NSA mid about the period mid-2000s when NSA was evaluating switches and routes, switches built to be CALEA compliant, which is being sold to the, US, to the Department of Defense. They found security problems with every single switch they evaluated. I said, so the others were okay? And the guy said, I didn't say that. Okay, every single switch. 
So I testified in Congress last year during the Apple FBI case, and I, uh, one of my signal intelligence friends said, put in the, the Greek case. I said, I don't want to do that. I do it all the time. He said, put in the Greek case and say there are other cases. I said, really? And he said, if they ask you, tell them to ask Rick Legend, who at that point was deputy director of NSA. No one asked me, uh, but I urge you to ask. <laughs> um, but the point is, yes, there were other cases. There are cases we don't yeah. know well, about. There are cases in the internet context where we know that foreign, st foreign governments have targeted our wiretapping capability as a counterintelligence mechanism. The Aurora attacks by the Chinese, they targeted Google and Microsoft's lawful intercept packages so they could find out whether their people were being... Right. So they were being intercepted on. But they I see Alvaro is trying to get a word in edgewise. Yeah, here. So, oh, okay. so um, continuing my theme here. Um, Please. So don't we have to weigh, first of all, I do think it's peculiar that we have to go to Greece for, I mean, we're five, six, seven times the size of Greece. I actually don't have a Greek population. I apologize. We're I significantly we're larger than Greece. Isn't it strange that we have to go to Greece for an actual example of abuse of the back door? And, Number one. Number two, uh, um, don't we have to do a policy weighing between the fact that of 100 windows, yeah, like the Greek window might get broken, uh, broken into against the value of creating a front door or back door for law enforcement into so, these really compelling cases uh, 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 of murder, you know, kidnapping, child molestation, et cetera? Or changing the route of the presidential election, yes. Um, <laughs> Good, great, good, but we, but we need to weigh these things, right? Right, 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 right. So when you talk about building it into infrastructure, right. you talk about building it in for everybody for long term. It doesn't go away. Yeah. It's still there, and it's very dangerous. Right. One. Two, as I said earlier, we're moving to a better and better security story. I don't want to say we're at a great security story. I mean, I got asked the other day when I was at Tufts by a student reporter, um, what are the three things you recommend? And I said, it, you know, as if free were enough, I said, update, automatic updates. I said, don't let yourself get spearfished or open attachments. That requires a lot on the user end because it requires educating the user to take time. I had an incident earlier this, at last, about a year ago now, where I got an email from somebody at Princeton uh, purporting to be um, the secretary of the dean, inviting me to something in Berlin. Um, and it was all in the attachment. I did go to Princeton. I work in the area of security and liberty, which was what this meeting was about. This was plausible. I'm not going to open the attachment. I spent a whole lot of time figuring out whether or not this, the, someone by that name was a secretary to the dean. Turned out it was. I opened the letter. I complained to the person. I said, you don't do this. I complained when I got to Berlin. And the computer scientist said it was the dean of the policy school who sent that out. We would never have done it that way. Um, but the point is, you know, it's, you have to educate everybody, that's hard. And the third thing is two-factor authentication. Um, I mentioned that the uh, vulnerabilities are getting more rare. Mm. Um, one of the problems about the kind of Russian attacks we saw on civil society is that civil society is less well protected. Yeah. Um, one of the problems on attacks on industry is that they don't go after the large companies, which are now getting much better at protecting themselves. They go after the small contractors working for the large companies, and they get in that way. Um, no, we're never going to be perfect. That doesn't mean you leave your house unlocked. Well, I want to I want to address what you said, Alvaro, as well, in, in the sense of, yes, this is actually a weighing exercise. We right. need to weigh the equities and try and figure out what the right answer is. Uh, and ideally, this isn't a religious debate. This is a factual debate. Um, what's often missing from this factual debate from the law enforcement perspective is the recognition of all of the crimes that are prevented right. or could be prevented right. through the deployment of encryption. Right. Financial crimes, other crimes, people getting held up for their phones. Once everybody's phone is locked down, what, you're stealing a brick. Um, what's the point? And those are violent crimes right. often. Or even crimes that could fundamentally destabilize the nature of our democracy. Right. Like, this is a critical tool, and in fact, one of basically only two. Matt Blaze often discusses it, a computer scientist who's uh, common one in these of my circles. Frequent co um, which is basically the two things we have to sec for security are maintaining the simplicity of our systems, um, because as they get more complex, that introduces more errors and more ways of exploiting it, or encryption. Right. And 
you know, and this fits into Susan's narrative of us just sort of barreling toward the future with extreme rapid change, and these systems are just getting more and more complex. Right. Um, so we can't rely on the simplicity to save us. We need yeah. to rely on the encryption. But let me give you a, a really concrete example, and for me very compelling. The National Center to End Domestic Violence, I think that's the right name. Um, I'd have to look up it in my book. Um, women are subjected to vast amounts of domestic violence. Some of them get killed. Often evidence is on their phone. But the National Center for Domestic Violence believe that, that the devices should have be locked and not openable. Why? Because in the, in the way they weigh things, the number of investigations that are thwarted are, do not outweigh, or rather the number of, of ways that the, the protecting of women's communications and ability to get out of the situation is more important than the ability to easily investigate uh, based on data right. on the phone. And, and this is why I'm pro-encryption. I mean, this is why, I, 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 uh, this is why I'm pro-encryption. I mean, I'm done devil's this, advocating. No, I'm going to continue being devil's advocate, but like, uh, um, yes, encryption is important for everyone. We all have bank accounts, et cetera. But let's face it, there's certain people for whom encryption is particularly important. And yes, in law enforcement size, some of those folks are bad guy criminals. And I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't make light of it. Some terrible, horrible people who are committing horrible acts uh, uh, and endanger our society. But you know who else it's important for? Victims of domestic violence. Um, civil rights activists, political dissidents. There is a really powerful account. Um, and I wish, uh, well, that's the next one I was going to okay, say. Uh, but um, uh, about how in South Africa, the ability to have secure communications was critical in the movement to end apartheid. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, um, uh, uh, political dissidents, civil rights activists, journalists. Can you imagine what reporting would be like today in Trump's America if reporters didn't have the ability to securely communicate with sources uh, in the White House and in the executive branches? I mean, there are fundamentally strong pro-democracy arguments to encryption that, that we need to put on the table alongside these other things we need to weigh against. Right. No, I've always I've taken probably for a dozen years now the security versus security argument, right. um, in large part because people like you I think are better equipped to do the privacy right, civil right, liberty right. side. It's not that I don't believe in it. I believe in it strongly. Yep. Um, but I think there is this other piece that is an important part, and we shouldn't just say oh yeah it's privacy versus security because right. it's not. It really is security versus security. Right. Well, and so we talked a bit about um, how we need to. I mean, the way I always frame this is we should stop talking about how we can force the technology to adapt to law enforcement because that's a fool's errand. We should focus on how we help law enforcement adapt to the technology. A part of that is more resources for law enforcement so they actually understand what is available um, and have the resources to take advantage of it. Um, another thing that's come up, and, and this comes back to one of Alvaro's questions, is the question of investigative hacking. Lawful hack. I don't like to call it lawful hacking because whether it's lawful turns on the details of the case. Um, but hacking by the government, the use of existing exploit, uh, existing vulnerabilities, rather than trying to mandate a cross-world vulnerability that they can exploit. This is something you've written about. I'd love for you to talk a bit about sure. that. Sure. So um, I wrote about this with Matt Blaze, uh, Sandy Clark, and Steve Belovin. And we talked about, look, in some cases, that's going to be the only way to get in. And this is, in fact, what tailored access operations do at a much grander scale, and not against Americans. Um, it, we know Usually. That, right. Ideally. Right. right. Uh, we know that uh, the FBI has been employing it since the early 2000s. They used it in a case, uh, a bombing threat case in the state of Washington um, to find out where the IP address, where the, the computer that was issuing, where the person who was issuing the threats, where that computer that he was issuing the threats through was, and then were able to get evidence and arrest him. Um, it's a two-step process. The first thing is that you have to go into the device and find out what operating system it is, what version that is, what applications are on it, what versions they are. Then you have to go back in and actually put in an exploit. Uh, use a vulnerability to collect data. The data might be the communications that are coming off the machine. The data might be simply the encryption key, and then you wiretap normally. In the papers that we wrote on the subject, we suggested that two warrants were needed, one to actually investigate the machine and one to put uh, things on it. Uh, as far as we can tell, law enforcement has used two warrants. It's an important approach. It's a necessary approach. It's not an approach that scales real well because it scales well when people don't patch their machines. 
Uh, and here I am urging everybody to patch their machines. It scales well when vulnerabilities are really easy to find. As vulnerabilities get harder to find, it scales less well. Um, that said, it is an important technique. Well, I, I mean, I'd suggest, one, it's an important alternative to a backdoor mandate. Two, it doesn't necessarily scale broadly, but I'd argue that's a feature rather that's than right. a bug. Like, if, you, if the state could easily, in a scalable way, surreptitiously break into any computer at once, I'd say that's a problem. But so this conversation about government hacking is a somewhat sensitive one uh, that we've been talking about a lot more in DC since uh, the crypto debate sparked back up, especially in the context of something called vulnerability equities, which you're very aware of. Um, that's policy wonk for how do we decide whether the government should be able to hold on to information about vulnerabilities to use that info versus disclosing it to the vendor so those things can be patched and everybody's security can be improved. There's definitely a weighing that happens about, well, we can use this to break into systems for investigations or intelligence, but if we do that, we are leaving other, other people vulnerable, and how do we make that decision? And so uh, there's some legislation to try and codify some strong standards around this. There's also a broader conversation about how do we impose clear, strong safeguards for the hacking itself, which we're kind of behind on. Um, but I'd like to go for a moment to the vulnerabilities equities process, which is even if, the comp even if the government would report the vulnerability at the time they find it, it takes time to patch, mm -hmm. and it takes time for people to accept the patch. Sometimes uh, companies or people won't accept the patch because it breaks things, breaks other things that they're running on their machine. So it is not the case that if a vulnerability gets reported, everything is immediately gone for the government. Looks like you're thinking hard there, Alva. Yeah, uh, um, uh, I'll say this quickly, and then, and then uh, I worry about a couple things. I, I, I worry, so we've been having a policy conversation, right? Um, and I worry what happens when it becomes a legal conversation again, because I think there was a very, uh, um, we, we, what's the expression when you uh, almost get hit by a car, but you get, it doesn't hit you? Uh, um, dodge we dodged a bullet. Yeah, thank you. I don't know why my <laughs> what is that English is you, slow today. You dodge a bullet. Yeah, what, what do you call that? What do you, what do you call that? Um, we dodged a bullet there because I uh, um, let me say two things. I think the policy arguments for encryption are much stronger than the legal arguments. Um, we make fun of the fact that there's an 18th century law used to try to compel Apple to do things. The All Writs Act. The All Writs Act. Um, that's a good sound bite, but it's not very effective legally. I mean, I think there were some very good briefs on behalf of Apple, but um, in terms of the law, uh, uh, I, I, I don't think our arguments are nearly as strong as the policy. And as someone who was on Capitol Hill for five years, uh, um, it is pretty darn compelling when law enforcement comes to you and says, I got 100 phones, uh, murder investigation, uh, racketeering investigation, you know, uh, child abuse investigation, I can't unlock them. You know, uh, 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 can't you help me get in here? So both of these arguments, I think, are much harder than we would like them to be. Uh, uh, you want me to get technical. What's that? You want me to get technical. No, I, I, the reason I wasn't saying anything is because I can give you technical reasons why, yeah, why right. compromising the security of a device or, or eliminating end-to-end -end encryption by putting a, a, a backdoor, frontdoor, exceptional yeah. access. And you know, you mentioned irresponsible encryption. And what I, what I would say back is, my god, what Rosenstein is talking about is irresponsible encryption. I, I actually don't want you to get technical. I, okay. I, I want us to, to speak to people's uh, hearts and minds rather than, well, hearts and minds rather than their brains. Uh, okay. uh, um, because the arguments we're getting on the other side uh, are very impactful that way. And that's why I think these pro-democracy, I wasn't saying anything because it's a little repetitive, but why these pro-democracy arguments are so important to make. Uh, because yeah, in a room where folks care about facts and and uh, and and science, you know these arguments are extremely powerful. But we need to figure out how to, how to bundle them in uh, um, in messages that speak to hearts and minds, because that's what's coming at us on the other side, and we will lose uh, if we don't have the numbers that we would need in Congress. So, I, for me, the most powerful arguments mm. are about protecting democracy. Yep. Because I think the threats are really quite serious. I'm not going to address the Facebook threats and the Twitter threats and so on, because those are outside the realm of cryptography. They're in a, a different, how do you control misinformation on social networks. But on the going within organizations and undermining the organizations, 
yes, those, those, those organizations have to protect themselves in a myriad of ways, but they can't do so effectively without end-to-end -end encryption and, um, and secure devices. Those are an essential piece that goes back to Matt's line. Yeah, I don't know, I feel a challenge in terms of both resources, skills, and just mindset when it comes to civil society having to argue these things. Because if we argued like they did, mm. um, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, I think it might actually be effective, but like, that would mean we are putting in front of Congress, here's a woman who got beaten nearly to death because her husband was able to get into her phone and find something that set him off. Here's the journalist in Mexico, you know, hanging from a street lamp, murdered, because the cartels were able to sniff his communications. Here's the person rotting in a cell in China for being a dissident. You know, like, putting those people in front of policymakers. But that's not actually Wait. a skill set that civil society really has. But we, well, we need it. I mean, we do, it, no, it, I know, and I, I, I wonder because how Because that, that right there is, yeah. you know, it, it, that 30 seconds is the most powerful yeah. argument I've heard for Here's the for democracy we are potentially right. losing right, right, because right. things right. weren't encrypted. Or because people didn't use their two-factor. Yeah, and, and, and here's the thing about, about politics is the anecdote is extraordinarily powerful. Uh, you get a real human being. You know, if you're organizing a hearing, the first thing a good legislator says is, where's my human? Right? Like, where's, where's my person? Right? Where, where is the actual human being affected by this? And any hearing you have where you can have either someone from law enforcement uh, uh, or a, a victim or someone, um, a real human being is so much more powerful. And I think we need to do more of that in this debate if we're going to win. Indeed. On that note, let's, uh, let's shift over to questions. And I see a number of hands being raised. And we will start with this young lady right here. Hi, I'm Rebecca McKinnon. Um, I work upstairs. Um, I have um, a, f a few questions um, picking up on exactly what you were just talking about, civil society and the global dimensions. Uh, and the human rights dimensions of this. Um, you know, you, you're hearing from a lot of, you know, not just in this country is encryption being challenged, but say the United Kingdom, Theresa May and other members of her cabinet. Um, you know, the, the attack on encryption in many democracies uh, is, is heavy. And there's a challenge in that when you get beyond sort of the usual organizations who specialize in kind of the intersection of technology and human rights, nobody's talking. You're not hearing from Green Greenpeace. You're not hearing from Transparency International about why encryption is so vital, that kind of global civil society is not really joining this fight. Um, in, in the way it needs to, and, and the way it needs to be fought across the entire democratic world. Um, and uh, I, I was at a, um, at a conference not too long ago about sort of the attacks on global civil society, and there were all these different groups, um, most of which were not expert in technology. And yeah, it kind of tried to talk to them about encryption. It's just something they hadn't thought of. Uh, and so I'm just wondering if, if there's any thoughts about how to kind of really raise the profile of the importance to, to democracy that global civil society really get on board with this issue. Um, so can I answer that? Sure, yeah. Which is, I actually, as I wrote the book, I grow more and more concerned. I handed in the manuscript March 30th, and of course more came out about the Russian attack since. So about a month ago, I published something in Foreign Policy that exactly talks about the Russians coming after town halls and civil society. And I did it for two reasons. I wanted to, to get staff in DC to think about it, and I wanted civil society to think about it. So if there are ways to push that out, because it talks exactly about that problem. But, you know, that's, that's one small piece that's, that doesn't answer the question, but it's a chink. Yeah. Well, and a little bit of self-promotion that might perhaps also offer a little bit of enlightenment. Uh, we at OTI did do a series of papers about the threat to encryption in three, three separate places, the UK, France and Germany. Um, and I wish it gave us really great, easy answers about how to counter those threats. It more so was just an eye opener on how clear and present those threats are. And trying to figure out strategy for addressing that so is something I we're think thinking UK very hard about. It's a funny situation because you hear the sec Home Secretary saying one thing 
but I do not hear GCHQ echoing it. Mm -hmm. And I have heard sotto voce that GCHQ, which is their equivalent of NSA, not agreeing, but it's sotto yeah. voce, which might say that we have a loud home secretary, or they have a loud home secretary without necessarily having the support. One can hope. I mean, and certainly Germany is the bright spot where, where Germany seems to have a very strong, committed federal position in support of encryption, and they are instead focusing on targeted hacking operations instead. But, but I don't know fully. I, uh, you know, I did that one little chink. It's not my expertise. Uh, sometime I have to go back to Tufts and start teaching again. Um, but, but, um, but civil, I completely agree with you that civil society needs to learn more. I know the journalism schools are now educating people. I don't know why that, that it hasn't happened for civil society. So it's both the education level, but it's also the informa information level, and that's the harder one to me. Hi, I'm Chris Savage. I, I teach a course in cyber law, and all my students you know, came of age after 9-11, and so they have this different mindset than some of us older folks have. And I try to frame it the following way, and I appreciate your reaction. The constitutional rights are expensive in terms of lives and in terms of money. Everyone knows we have a right to have guns, right? And that costs us roughly 30,000 mm -hmm. lives a year. Okay, society's okay with that. How many lives is it worth to have good, strong privacy? I, I, I have people who are like law enforcement oriented. It's like, okay, fine. If you don't have access to this data, how many people are going to die that won't die today? And is it anywhere near the number we let die every year with guns or with cars? <laughs> That's an interesting approach. Uh, right, to think, to move out of emotions and to actually think in a public policy point of view. Right, 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 right. Um, what's their reaction? Of course. They say, oh, it's totally different. I mean, the, the, it's a personal right to have guns, and protecting us is different. I say, I, I'm, I'm the Holmesian bad man as a policy analyst. I just care about how many die. Right, why so I Why do you care this and not that? And I'm, yeah. I'm astonished. I'll just say, I'm astonished at how completely unpersuasive those kinds of arguments are politically. I mean, I find them persuasive. But when you, you know, or arguments around terrorism where it's like, okay, well, yes, that was a horrible attack uh, two days ago. Um, how many people have died of terrorism in the United States compared to slipping in the bathtub or anything else? You know, but like those, those arguments do not carry emotional weight. We'll send the bathtubs, we'll send the um, bathtubs to get Mo and we'll take care <laughs> of it. Exactly, yeah. Why aren't we having a war against, you know, a war for bath mats? You know, we need more bath mats. Um, but no, the, the, those kinds of arguments are considered to be um, insensitive and not recognizing the severity of the threat. And, and, and also, you know, terrorism has too broad a definition. But, you know, if you whittle away all the kind of racist stuff, uh, uh, at its core is violence for a political purpose. And if it, it's, it, you know, we treat terrorism differently for the same reason we treat a hate crime differently, which is, you know, um, when you're killing someone as a terrorist, you're, you're doing it to scare all these other people, right? Whereas if someone kills another person you know, in a bar fight, uh, um, it, has, it does not have that same impact. And so you know, there, is, there is a reason we weigh these lives differently, uh, and, and a pretty compelling one at that. Um, but I agree. I, don't, I, I think this is a, this is a well, good way to. In, in law school, right, I teach you how to argue. And I say, sometimes you need to argue based on fear, because that's your most effective argument. Sometimes you need to argue based on data, but recognize what you're doing and recognize what your opponent's doing. Right. That's a so I want to add one more thing to this, which is that it, the law enforcement argument is not about security. It's about more efficient investigations. And once you frame it as more efficient investigations versus the right to secure ourselves, it becomes a completely different dynamic. And I think that's the right dynamic to put it in. Once you frame it as more efficient investigations, from an agency that has not modernized in 25 years, that's a different dynamic. Another question. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, so Jason Pielmeyer from the Global Network Initiative. Um, Susan, just wanted to thank you, not just for your book, but for your kind of 
public advocacy and, and education on this issue. Um, in, in a prior life, I worked in, in the State Department and was involved in the last round of conversations around encryption in the last administration. Um, and it was incredibly enlightening. Uh, one of the things that was very useful was having uh, a guy like Ed Felton uh, in the government, being able to help sort of educate and inform the conversation um, from a technical perspective. Um, uh, but I worry that a lot of governments don't have uh, people like that uh, who are not working for a particular agency and therefore bound to try and sort of uh, represent the, the views of, of whatever uh, interest that agency is seeking to, to advance. Um, and, I, and I worry also that in our judicial branch, where a lot of these things are going to get sorted out, most judges have no idea, and the law clerks uh, are also kind of woefully undereducated. Um, and 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 that's just here in the U.S. Where you know, and you think about overseas and other in other countries, uh, I think that that those gaps are even larger. So I wonder, you know, what can be done. I think it's really important to continue to have people who are seen as neutral academics with technical or or, or neutral uh, um, sort of policy advisors with technical expertise who can be seen to be providing, you know, kind of level setting information. Um, uh, I don't, you know, that's happened ad hoc through people just sort of establishing themselves. But I wonder if there isn't some way to elevate that role and offer those kinds of services to other governments who are all, uh, you know, not just the UK and, and Australia and others who've been vocal about it, but every government in, in the world is, is seeking to crack this nut somehow. Um, and whether you've been aware of any efforts along those lines or have thoughts about how that could be done. So in the last few years, uh, suddenly schools are thinking about educating in this intersection of cyber and policy. And um, I am at Tufts in part because of efforts of my colleague Jeff Talaferro in the political science department at, at Tufts to actually hire somebody that bridges. And therefore, the point is to educate kids that bridge with some technical expertise. They're not going to have Ed's expertise because they're not computer scientists. But trying to teach some of the computer scientists policy material so that they can come down here and teaching some of the policy students, including international because Fletcher is international. There's also, uh, I should say that a large kickstart to the academic efforts has been from the Hewlett Foundation, which gave 15 million each to Harvard, not sorry, not Harvard, to MIT, Stanford, and Berkeley to start programs in cybersecurity policy without actually knowing what it meant, how to, what a program in that would be. And that was four years ago. Um, I suspect there's some, is there Hewlett money here funding people? I know that I spoke to somebody. Hewlett is a supporter of some of our cybersecurity work, yeah. And, and I, I was in Congress yesterday talking to one of Wyden's staff who was half supported by some Hewlett Foundation money. Until well, so there's the Tech Congress program. Again, I will uh, self-promote New America. Uh, OTI hosts a program called Tech Congress, which puts technical fellows on the Hill. Um, you may have actually been speaking. Were you talking to Chris? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So that's actually yeah, um, a Tech Congress fellow. Uh, and they're actually doing interviews for the next year of fellowships right now. So I think Celia's work. Isn't she doing some of this stuff? Um, not I mean, really. Public we have a public interest technology program that's yeah. doing work, but not directly related to this. Got it. Um, I wanted to see. One response to what you're suggesting, I mean, part of what you're talking about, Jason, is uh, how do we actually get the technology expertise in front of the policymakers? Uh, I'm, I'm more focused on how do we actually scare them. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm fair, I fear that we don't convince them based on get, making sure they all have a strong technical understanding of this. Um, and I always think back to the VPPA, which is the Video Privacy Protection Act. This is the strongest privacy law on the planet basically, and certainly in US law. Um, this is a law that protects the privacy of your video rental and video viewing records. And the reason this was passed, and passed very quickly uh, once the inciting event happened, was when uh, Bork was up for being confirmed for the Supreme Court, and records of his video rentals were leaked to the press. There was nothing particularly compromising in them, but you could hear every lawmaker on Capitol Hill thinking back about what they have rented <laughs> and what might happen if that got out. And within a year, they had passed the strongest privacy law ever because they were afraid. And how do we get them to recognize the level of threat? How do we get them to think about their phone getting compromised, their messages getting right. compromised? And they're thinking more and more about it now, and that's why we're seeing 
top level people in uh, the political parties and in the White House and uh, on the Hill starting to use Signal, like starting to use end to end encrypted communications. So once we have them all doing that, and then we can say to them, well, but guys, we all use the same infrastructure. If you want to have it, everybody else has to have it too. There's no way of separating out the good guys and the bad guys in the consumer technology economy that we have. That is when we win. Um, I worry how many more m massive, awful Russian or Chinese or other state-based attacks and leaks it will take to get us there. But that seems possibly the only trajectory by which we win. Right. So, you know, in that line, when I was preparing testimony last year on the Apple FBI case, I wanted to talk about phones as authenticators because that's the follow-on to Kalia. Kalia undermined the security of the network. You undermine the security of the phones, and you undermine the phone, phones as authenticators. That was my real argument. That was my real concern. I'm a geek, pocket protector or not. I'm a geek, but um, but I talked about photos within my first paragraph because everybody has photos on their phone. And just like they worry about their messages, they worry about their photos. You can get to them with photos. So I think, it, I think Kevin and Alvaro are absolutely right. You have to talk emotionally. But you also, at least I, can't lose my being a scientist at, at heart. No. You want the factual arguments. They're just, they're just not going to carry the day. Yes. Oh, Mike. Please wait for the mic. Thank you. I was going to say, that's Bob. I got it. <laughs> Uh, Bob Gelman, Privacy Consultant. You talked about how the VPPA got passed, and that's exactly right. Why isn't John Podesta, you know, the horror story that would force Congress to realize? And if that didn't do it, I don't know that anything well, it was will. partisan. I mean, he was he, he was he was for Hillary, and uh, half the country is not for Hillary, right? Or at least 78 percent of the Republicans are not for Hillary. Well, I mean, one thing I wonder is. Uh, 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 we have all this concern about fake news and propaganda, which I think is a legitimate concern. We don't want anyone messing with, with our elections. But at the same time, I think there's a legitimate question of how much impact did that content have versus all the legitimate news content based on stolen emails that the Russians stole and leaked? Isn't, wasn't that probably the bigger impact? And so why are we, not, why are we having a national freakout over fake news instead of a national freakout about like, why isn't everybody using two-factor and or how do we make email more secure? Like, isn't that perhaps the more important issue? And isn't encryption a linchpin to that? Hi, Amanda Lopez. I'm actually studying most, mostly IoT, but security issues on how they impact IoT. Um, blockchain technology removes the old identification protocols, for example, like no longer identifying a computer by its MAC address, you know, the IP address. So I'm wondering, will using blockchain in the future with two-factor two encryption alleviate some of these security issues that you're talking about today? Um, one, there's a certain advantage to devices being a certain level of anonymous. Um, we actually want that for political speech and all sorts of other reasons. Um, it's, we want it for investigations. The, the U.S. government funded the development of Tor, uh, the onion router, uh, which enables you to browse without the, your, the site knowing who you are or anybody eavesdropping along the way knowing who you are. Uh, and that's because, um, you know, some military person in a safe house in the Mideast wants to be able to communicate with Annapolis, and the, the safe house doesn't want to let the ISP in the Mideast know that they're communicating with Annapolis or an FBI uh, investigator looking at a child porn site doing an investigation doesn't want the address to resolve to FBI.gov. Uh, there are lots of legitimate, strong reasons for anonymity. So I don't see blockchain catching on in the, in the realm in which you're suggesting. Blockchain catching on in other areas, absolutely. But I don't, uh, but I don't see it catching on for devices. Can you, can you provide a little more connective tissue there? I, I sure. Blockchain is a technology that essentially authenticates a device by connecting it to a previously known device, which is authenticated by connecting to a previously known device, and so on. So on the internet, nobody knows if you're a dog, except these days we can figure out if you're a dog and what breed and how old you are. Um, but, but this will say, well, you're really authentic because we know you're connected to this other thing which we knew was authentic. It's useful for some kinds of transactions, like financial transactions. Uh, Bob was asking me earlier about healthcare transactions. I haven't thought enough about blockchain to be able to answer him in any intelligent way, or to answer him at all, in fact, intelligent or not. Um, 
But uh, blockchain is useful in some domains. I think it's perhaps a little bit oversold. It is also a technology that's 20 years old, didn't catch on 20 years ago. But, it's, uh, but it will be useful in some domains. I just don't see it useful here. Any more questions? Thanks, uh, Ryan Polk from the Internet Society. So I really liked how you broke down uh, encryption between uh, the encryption debate with intelligence community and also with the law enforcement community. I think that there's an issue right now where the debate gets a little bit oversimplified, where it's just about encryption as a whole. So what I've been wondering is, in terms of framing this debate and moving this debate forward is, how would you break down this debate into more manageable pieces, and where should these discussions take place? Should this happen at Congress, or should it happen somewhere else? So I think the debate has many different pieces, and thank you for asking that question. I'm sure Alvaro has other pieces, and perhaps Kevin too. But I would talk about communication, and as I said, I think that debate is over. I think you'll even find the FBI saying that debate is over, despite Rosenstein's um, speech three weeks ago. Um, and that's because, um, you can't control the apps that cross the border. You know, if somebody comes with a phone, border control is not going to look at every single app to see whether or not it enables end-to-end -end encryption. I think the end-to-end -end encryption debate is over. Um, devices is not over, although devices is a funny kind of thing because while Apple controls the whole manufacturing process, Google does not. Where do you put those controls in? Um, so I would separate into devices, end-to-end -end encryption and perhaps cloud, and then make, of course, the point that most of cloud is going to be accessible via court order because somebody has to be able to get at the data in the cloud. I, by the way, use a cloud provider where the data is encrypted in the cloud and only I have the key. If I lose the key, my data is gone because nobody else has the key. Is it Fire? Uh, it's uh, Spider, Spider Oak. Spider. And when I first started using it, it was really hard to use, and now it's become easy, not because I'm expert, but because they've become easier. Um, I would split it that way. I would split it into talking about what are the three real threats. Um, I would split it into talking about what national security did and what law enforcement needs to do. What law enforcement needs to do is complicated in part because I'm not a law enforcement investigator. I don't, I've never been a policeman. I don't know how investigations work. I can tell you some things I'm hearing from them that don't make sense, but how they move forward is an interesting part of the debate. So I have argued, you know, it's, on the one hand I argue that um, they're not doing things right, and then I say, let's give them 10 times as much money to do their going dark efforts because they need to improve there. Let's give them more money here. So I, I would split it on those various dimensions. Uh, what one would do, um, I wrote the book because I wanted to have a voice, and I wanted a voice there in the public debate. I think having op-eds and articles in, in different places around the country, not just in Washington, I blog for Lawfare Blog because it, it gets the attention of staffers. But I think it's important to, to get attention elsewhere, too, to explain to real people. And, and these guys are better at connecting to real people. I'm still a scientist. Uh, but talking about real people with real issues, the kinds that, that, that Kevin was describing and that Alvaro was talking about, I think that's a very useful way to, to, to discuss the issue. So my name is Wajid. Uh, I work for U.S. Department of Agriculture as a technical lead in networks. So uh, there are two laws, Communications Act of 1934 and Telecommunications Act of 1996. So do you think they are already obsolete in the light of new changes in cloud computing uh, with security? Uh, most of the things that they talk about, they are like from antiquity. What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> you know, I haven't looked at the Telecommunications Act of 96 in a long time, and in the like, one of 34, much longer. When I looked at the one in 34, I only looked at one small piece. Um, so I don't really have an answer. I mean, I, I'll, I'll go to something else that I do have an answer for, which is you need to frame the laws in a general way without being specific to the technology. So. Matt Blaze, Steve Bellavin, uh, 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 why can Stephanie Pell and I wrote a paper a year, uh, a year ago now on how um, IP communications really changed the Smith and Katz decisions about separating content from metadata 
Now, there have been a lot of law professors who've talked about how the old wiretap regime doesn't work philosophically with, with the new IP technology. We didn't do a philosophical argument. We did a simply technical argument and showed where places where the wiretap law simply didn't make sense because of IP communications. In the end of the paper, we talked about what judges should do now, uh, what law enforcement should do now, and how legislators should begin to think. And that's why I bring up the paper. And we said, you want to think about technology broadly, but don't ever legislate in a way that's tied to specific technology, because the only thing you know, it'll be outdated very quickly. So one note on that. Um, the paper, by the way, is called It's Complicated. <laughs> or It's Too Complicated. I'll just, I think we're. Uh, uh, Maybe one more question. OK, so let me just briefly say the following. Uh, um, as a former legislative staffer, you, you hear this a lot. The issue is what happens, you write the broad law, you write the technology neutral law, and then lobbyists come and they're like, well, this is so vague. How does this, how does this apply to me? I mean, what, what are the rules? Does this apply to me? And you say, oh, OK, I need to clarify. This is who it applies to. This is who it doesn't apply to. And then folks will come in and say, well, my, my thing doesn't really fit in your framework for the following good reasons, right? Or someone shows up and say, oh, you want to pass this bill? Get me out of it, right? Uh, and so suddenly you're carving out these folks, and then you're saying, oh, but it doesn't really work in these instances. And, and before you know it, you've got this technology-specific law that is outdated. And so I, I think in DC we use this trope of don't use technology-specific laws, but the choice isn't technology-specific laws versus technology-neutral laws. It's, it's usually a technology-specific law versus no law at all because you can't pass the thing. Um, so um, let me, I just wanted to add a little asterisk there and say it's well, part of that. I'll add another sense. flip side yeah. where I guess there's a little disagreement. Good to have a little disagreement. Um, technology neutrality or technology agnosticism in drafting often means that it will later get expanded and extended right. to stuff that you did not contemplate that right. you did, maybe didn't want it to apply to. Right. Um, and so in some ways, being somewhat specific is, is, is smart lawmaking. But I, I also share Alvaro's concern about there is this problem of we try to be non-specific, but we have to be specific enough. And so then you end up having weird legal categories in the law that don't actually map to meaningful technical or practical categories. Like say in a law that, I'll just say, it's called ECPA. Don't worry about what it is. Uh, where there's these categories of electronic communication service providers and remote computing service providers, which are kind of specific to 1986 kind of don't really map to anything in particular right now in a clear way, and it's just a mess. And so if you're looking for outdated laws, the ECBA of 1986, oh, so outdated. And how long have we been trying oh, to? Oh, God, we've been, we've been trying to reform it for the past 10 years, basically. And, uh, but, yeah. By weekly calls? <laughs> <sighs> I think this is the last question. So I agree with you what you said on the, the when the lobbyists come and you have to put vague, uh, uh, like unrelated things in there. So in Communications Act, there is a <coughs> particular section that talks about boats, which has no way related to Communications Act. Uh, and it is like how you uh, travel in sea in boats and all that. So. I, I'm guessing that in that time, somebody wanted to put... Uh, Might be after the T.J. Hopper case. It, it was. I mean, I have read it, and I was like, oh, this is... Uh, Might be after a famous case yeah. of two barges going up the East Coast yeah. during a storm and not having radios. That's yeah, probably so why it's there. I, I think it is very complicated forming laws. One last question. This gentleman here. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of everybody up there, um, and, and I think the arguments you make are very powerful. And, and one thing I worry about is that the discussion does become a little bit binary in some places where we say um, the, the math hasn't changed, um, none of this stuff can be done. There are ways that you can architect the technology uh, to uh, – we everybody could use phones that are completely locked down, use uh, cloud-based services where there's no recovery key. Um, the, the you know end-to-end -end encrypted messaging applications, uh, but there are compromises that we make in order to be able to make the services usable or for other purposes. And so, um, I do think that one of the ways that we break this down a little bit is to start um, talking about the ways in which um, compromises would have impacts on security in a very technical uh, way. 
what are the trade-offs? Uh, if you were to architect the technology in a certain way, what would the impact be on security rather than to say, uh, we need encryption, or if we don't have encryption, or if encryption is not right. unbreakable. So, so one way you do it is you say, if you require exceptional access, and we said this in Keys Under Doormats, you break forward secrecy. Forward secrecy says every communication is encrypted with its own key. So when you connect to Google and you do a search, it's under forward secrecy. Now, in fact, Google saves the searches. That's how it informs its quality of search. Um, but anybody listening in and collecting all those communications to Google would have to break the key for each individual communication. Um, that's one way you can talk about it. And there, I was just going to say, she talks about four others, or actually three, there are basically four categories of risk that Susan lays out on page 92, at least of this uh, advanced I think uncorrected it's the same. proof. Um, yeah, page 92 of the book where she lists the four sort of, because you, I think you're right. The and you can find it, page yeah, 92 as yes. well as a <laughs> saying it's saying it's impossible or saying it's going to break the internet or whatever is not going to win the day and is not really accurate. You can build a key escrow system. The question is, how risky is that going to be? How much risk is that going to introduce? And is that worth the trade-off? Um, and I, I would expect that the NAS report will help us think through some of those questions when it comes out, which I hope will be soon. And I'm not allowed to comment, but I expect to it to come out soon. Yes. Um, and I think that is it for time. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Thank you to both thank of you. you for joining thank us. You. And thank you for a great book, which I think is going to contribute a lot to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.